And uh, now I'd like to, uh, introduce, um, to introduce this morning's keynote, um, Antonio Sanders, who is the Technical Group Supervisor for the Ground Data Systems Engineering Group at JPL. Antonio. Good morning. I'm Antonio Sanders, and I stand before you to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, Deputy Director of JPL, Lieutenant General Larry D. James. Larry D. James was appointed Deputy Director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in August 2013. At JPL, he is the laboratory's Chief Operating Officer, responsible to the Director for the day-to-day -day management of JPL's resources and activities. This includes managing the laboratory's solar system exploration, Mars exploration, astronomy, physics, earth science, interplanetary network programs, and all business operations. These activities employ 5,000 scientists, engineers, technicians, and business support personnel, generating over $2 billion in annual revenues. Prior to his retirement from the Air Force and his appointment as JPL Deputy Director, Lieutenant General James was the Air Force Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance at the Pentagon. He was responsible to the Secretary and Chief of Staff of the Air Force for policy formulation, planning, evaluation, oversight, and leadership of Air Force intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities. As the Air Force's senior intelligence officer, he was directly responsible to the Director of National Intelligence and the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and led more than 20,000 ISR officers, enlisted and civilian, across the Air Force ISR enterprise. He, was, he also commanded the 50th Space Wing, where he was responsible for the Air Force Satellite Control Network and command and control of all Air Force satellite systems. Lieutenant General James received his Bachelor of Science in Astronautical Engineering from the U.S. Air Force Academy as a distinguished graduate, and his Master of Science in Aeronautics and Astronautics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was also a Draper Fellow at the Charles Stark Draper Laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Lieutenant General Larry D. James. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, it really is an honor for me and a privilege for me to be here today. Um, of course, I'm kind of bummed because I was really trying to compete for the best presentation award this morning. So I guess that's already been given, so I'm out of the running. Um, oh, he's got another one, but it doesn't have my name on it. OK. Uh, interestingly, I was up at 5 this morning on a telecon with the NASA administrator to talk about the new NASA budget. Uh, as you may have read, uh, the NASA budget and all the budgets just were released by the White House and OMB. So, um, okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the good news is I think NASA came out at the top in terms of the least amount of cuts. <laughs> so uh, that's an excellent thing. I think overall our budget was cut about 1%. However, that probably makes us a target for all the other programs that got cut much more. So we'll see how that all plays out. This is just the first round in the budget process. But what I wanted to do today is uh, certainly uh, talk to you about what we're thinking about at JPL in terms of uh, ground systems and ground system architectures. And uh, really, first give you a little snapshot of the various missions we have because it is an incredible variety of missions that we have to deal with with respect to how we do the command and control. Uh, both current and future missions, and then really talk about our vision for the future and ground system control, especially as you look at more capable spacecraft and more capable ground systems. So that's really a broad outline of what we'll do today. Uh, my first uh, slide is actually a very self-promoting video about JPL. I will apologize up front for that. 
but it really talks to you about the culture of innovation that we try to, try to cultivate there at JPL. So we'll start with that and then we'll get into some of our current and future systems. What does JPL do? It's the most unique place to work on Earth. Our charter is to do things no one has done before. We do what no one else even dares to dream about. Imagination and innovation are crucial in being able to do the kind of work that we do. Innovation comes from people, but it also, I think, comes from structure and from the environment. If you can provide people with the appropriate tools, the appropriate workspace, the appropriate environments, you're also going to get a higher innovation output. One of the things that makes the JPL environment so special to work in is that even when you first walk on lab, it feels like a campus. And you walk around, you hear people talking about their work. What would be the best way to get a subsurface vehicle beneath the ice of Europa? And you're thinking, those people aren't just talking about it because they saw it on a movie somewhere. It's because they're really trying to figure out how to do it. As I tell our folks, the reality is this team makes history every day because they're doing things that no one else has ever done. So let's talk a little bit about our current missions. And in fact, speaking of those missions that make history, this is the Dawn mission. Uh, it's currently orbiting the asteroid Ceres, which is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt, really a protoplanet. I uh, just saw a paper that was coming out yesterday talking about ice volcanism on this protoplanet. So scientists are very excited about that. And we continue to orbit that uh, mission or that uh, planetoid, we've been around it now uh, two years uh, conducting science experiments. But again, history making in that it's electric propulsion, first time we've ever been to, uh, visited two independent celestial bodies with one mission, and uh, it actually won the Collier Trophy last year for the most outstanding achievement in air and space for the nation. So uh, pretty cool. Uh, Juno is our current mission to Jupiter. We just did uh, the orbit insertion this past July, July 4th as a matter of fact, and we're actually uh, going closer than we've ever been to the planet Jupiter, uh, roughly 3,000 miles above the cloud tops in a polar orbit, a 53-day orbit, and already generating tremendous science in terms of things that we didn't understand about the internal workings of the planet. Cassini, of course, is our mission around Saturn. Uh, been operating now uh, 13 years around, uh, around Saturn and, and a set of incredible findings there, all the pictures you see of things like Enceladus and geysers and all those things going on are really as a result of Cassini. And unfortunately, we run out of fuel uh, this year. So on September 15th, we will uh, burn the spacecraft into the atmosphere of Saturn to uh, destroy it, and uh, the mission will be over. But right now, we're actually doing a bunch of loops around Saturn, uh, flying closer to the rings than we've ever flown. If you go online, you can see some incredible pictures of uh, what we're finding there as we do that uh, final mission wrap-up. And of course, our primary rover on Mars, uh, Curiosity, this is actually a selfie uh, of the rover because we have a camera on our robotic arm that we can actually take a series of pictures around the, the rover and then stitch those together to give you this uh, particular picture. So uh, now going on, uh, let's see, four years, four and a half years of operation on the surface and continuing to do uh, incredible science there, proving that what Mars did have life, there are organics there, and, and all those questions that the scientists had before we were actually sending the rover up. And of course, uh, germane to this audience is our deep space network. Uh, we don't operate any of these systems without the deep space network, three locations around the globe. You can see them there on the slide. Really, you know, roughly 120 degrees apart, so we have 360 degree coverage, so we have 24 seven access to our spacecraft throughout the solar system. Um, so it's an incredible capability and we're continuing to upgrade that capability uh, as we move forward, and I'll talk a little bit later in the talk about uh, optical comm and how we're trying to go to that for that deep space network. So just uh, a quick snapshot of some upcoming missions, again, just to kind of set the stage for the challenges we face in terms of how we do our ground systems and command and control. So this is our next Mars mission called InSight. It is a lander, not a rover. It will launch in May of 2018. Its primary mission is to understand the core of Mars. Uh, uh, what is the core made of, what is the temperature of the core, et cetera. So it's got three very accurate seismometers on board that can measure movement to the half of a width of a hydrogen atom. So think about that for a minute. Uh, uh, so uh, we're right in that we just actually, they actually have to be in a, a, a evacuated sphere to operate so there's no atmosphere that impacts the seismometer. 
We just closed up that sphere last week and proved that it's holding vacuum. So uh, we'll get all that delivered to the uh, spacecraft uh, uh, itself uh, in July, and then we'll start the integration process for a launch in May of 2018. <clears throat> this is our next Mars rover, Mars 2020. Um, interestingly, as I talk about the future, uh, we're adding a lot more autonomy onto this uh, rover, so we can do a lot quicker driving on the surface of Mar Mars. Uh, so a lot of new instruments on this to not only show that there potentially could have been life, but also to be able to find life, microbes, uh, those sorts of things on the surface if they exist or, or below the surface. Uh, another key component of this mission is it actually will collect samples that we'll put in small tubes uh, for an eventual pickup and return to Earth uh, in the mid-2020s. So uh, it's, a, it's a sample return mission. It's the first step of that sample return to actually collect those samples. Uh, an interesting mission, uh, GRACE is our currently orbiting uh, gravity mission, which can measure the gravity of the Earth very accurately, uh, so accurately that you can actually detect the difference in mass between salt water and fresh water. So we can do those sorts of measurements globally, and we can actually measure aquifer depletion in the Central Valley of California based on the change in gravity because there's less water. Um, but those spacecraft, the current GRACE missions are getting old, so we're developing a follow-on mission, and again, that will launch probably in January or February of next year on a Falcon 9. Uh, so again, a tremendous uh, mission and incredibly uh, important for science and managing our resources on the Earth. Uh, this is a surface water ocean topography mission. This is an interferometric radar mission that will allow us to measure the height of freshwater bodies. Today, we measure the height of the ocean, saltwater bodies, but we can't measure the height of freshwater bodies. With this technology, we'll be able to do that. And if I back up to the GRACE mission, just to give you some thinking about the data requirements, the GRACE mission that I talked about before is about 3.7 gigabytes of data per day. SWAT will get us up to one terabyte of data per day. And then if I go to the next mission, which is the NASA Indian Space Research Organization, that's India, uh, synthetic aperture radar, which will launch in 2020, that gets us up to 3.2 terabytes of data per day that we have to handle. So again, I'm trying to set the stage here for the challenges that we face as we build these ever more incredible and, and capable spacecraft that generate these tremendous amounts of data. So that's a quick walkthrough of uh, the kind of some of the near term, and this is a little further out. Uh, this is a really cool mission. It's called Psyche because it's going to the asteroid Psyche. Uh, the interesting thing about this, it is a metal asteroid. So scientists believe this was a protoplanet that over time had its surface stripped away by asteroidal bombardment and those sorts of things, leaving only the core. So now scientists can go there and actually directly measure the core of a planet and start to understand uh, the, the physics behind that, how it was formed, and those sorts of things. So uh, we just started uh, developing this mission this year, and again, you can see a launch in 2023. And then Europa is a, is a hot topic. Uh, that is a, really a water moon around the uh, planet Jupiter. Uh, really excites the scientists because belief, beneath that icy surface, they believe that there's probably two to three times the amount of water there that the entire Earth has. That's how much water is on Europa. So obviously where there's water, there could be life. And so we're designing a couple of missions. One is uh, an orbiter called Europa Clipper for launch in 2022. And the second one is a lander that would actually go down to the surface of Europa for launch in 2024 or 2025. So uh, interestingly, the new NASA budget said, don't do the lander. So uh, uh, I think that will play out in Congress in a different way, but we'll see. So uh, now the focus on the ground system. And, and I would offer that we really have to think differently about how we do ground as we look out 10, 15, or 20 years. So we'll just uh, start to talk about that. Obviously, I think, you know, most of you know this. The reality is in many of our ground systems today, we're kind of still stuck in the early 2000 technology. You can see there, you know, voice nets, web-based tools, you know, some cloud interaction, those kind of things. But obviously the world has changed. Uh, you know, today everything is done with one device with incredible computing capability. And, and you can sc scroll between all the information that you need. You can get any question answered. I know some of you have been talking about Alexa and those kind of things. And so, so the world has indeed changed, and our ground systems really need to think about how do we keep up with that and utilize all these modern technologies. 
And so this is kind of my premise or my thesis. Um, because in our mind, there's really two components. Uh, it's not just the ground system operating uh, by itself anymore independently. Uh, you've got these today incredibly capable spacecraft. And 10 or 15 years from now, they are going to be even more capable. Uh, already, we can do fault detection and anomaly detection on board spacecraft. We can do data processing before we downlink it on spacecraft. And if you kind of think about 10, 15 years in the future, the capability of that spacecraft to actually operate and manage itself, uh, in our opinion, dramatically impacts how you design your ground system. And we at JPL pride ourselves on systems engineering. We consider that really one of our core strengths. So as we look at this problem, we say that the reality is that you have to think about this as an integrated system, the spacecraft, the links, and the ground. And how do you put those things together to be most efficient and most effective? So you can see that um, you know, it absolutely has to work together. It has to be an integrated systems approach in order to really take advantage of the power of each of the components of the system. So that's, I think, what we all have to think about because I think that starts to change how you design your ground system. Uh, and it does have to be that full look at what does the spacecraft do, what does the ground system do, and how do you integrate those effectively. Uh, the reality is today, even at JPL, we don't do that well. Uh, you know, we frankly do the satellite design. We go through all the standard things, SRR, PDR, CDR. And often the ground system is kind of, yeah, we're going to work on that. We'll get to that. We'll think about that. And then the whole data management question is also kind of set aside to say, OK, you're going to get you know, 3.2 terabytes of data a day. We'll think about that after phase C or phase D when we really start getting close to that. Uh, what we're trying to do now, ev even in project formulation, is to start to put all of that together. OK, here's a spacecraft. Here's the type of data it's going to generate. What's the architecture we have to have to handle that data? And what's the architecture we have as a system in order to operate this system. Uh, so we're trying to infuse that into our thinking as we do project formulation, as our engineers and scientists start to develop the initial concepts for the missions. Putting all that together versus just focusing on the shiny object of the spacecraft or the rover, and then everything else is kind of an aside as you get further downstream into the design. So that's kind of the, the, the broad theme of where we're trying to go. And obviously, this is driven in many ways by the fact that we have smarter spacecraft. Uh, I like to bring up Voyager. Uh, Voyager is an incredible mission. In fact, uh, it will celebrate its 40th anniversary this year. Uh, Voyager has been operating 40 years. It was launched in 1977. It's humanity's first interstellar spacecraft. Voyager 1 is now outside the solar system. But you can see the capability it had. Kilobytes of memory, 6,000 instructions per second. Compare that to an iPhone, 14 billion instructions per second. So the generational change of our spacecraft and our technology is, is dramatic. Even if you look at our, our Curiosity rover, it's, it's not all that great. I mean, it's a, rad, uh, it's a RAD 750, which is kind of the standard processor that we have out there right now. Uh, we're actually partnering with uh, Air Force Research Lab, uh, SMC, the NRO, to build the next generation uh, high performance uh, space computer, if you will. Uh, which will dramatically up the capability of those uh, orbital capabilities for the processor. But even that probably doesn't approach what the iPhone can do today in terms of processing power. So, but again, thinking 10 to 15 years from now, the processing power you're going to have on a spacecraft is going to be incredible. And so, you know, we're looking at concepts, for example, uh, if you go to Titan, Titan has a very thick atmosphere, we can operate in that atmosphere, but the fact is you're, you know, an hour and a half, two hours of communication time away. So you can't do real-time command and control. And so there has to be a tremendous amount of autonomy, artificial intelligence, fault tolerance, uh, you know, sensing and reacting and going to targets, all those sorts of things built into the spacecraft. And frankly, those are the things that uh, we also can transfer to Earth orbiting spacecraft. It doesn't, just because it's far away and we have to do it, doesn't mean you shouldn't apply those types of capabilities to your near-Earth orbiting spacecraft. Uh, another future concept is just a uh, you know, small body fleet that goes out to, let's say, a, a group of Trojan asteroids or whatever the case may be. But you can see there, there in the bottom, it's going to autonomously cruise, autonomously rendezvous, uh, autonomously examine these bodies, and then uh, autonomously 
process the data on board, and then send back what's important. So those are the kind of concepts we're thinking about uh, that then say, well, what does that mean for my ground system? You know, in the past, the ground system had to deal with everything. Okay, we, it went into safe mode. What do we do? Well, we form a tiger team, and we spend a week looking at the data, and we decide we're going to do something. I would offer that in the future, the spacecraft's going to deal with 95% of those issues itself. So what does that mean for the ground system? You have to think about that. And then even, uh, even going to Mars, we're bringing a lot of technology to our next uh, Mars rover. You saw Mars 2020. Uh, we're going to do something called terrain relative navigation where we have a snapshot based on our orbiter pictures of where we want to land. And as the rover comes in, it can basically apply that snapshot to say, well, I'm not where I thought I was going to be, so now I can divert a little bit and land where I want to be. So we're putting that technology on the next rover. Uh, and then you can see, like in the far left, the technology number two, that's ultimately doing large divor diverts uh, uh, with the rockets as we come down in order to even be more precisely located in terms of our landing spot. So these are just some examples of what we foresee the capabilities of the spacecraft are going to be in terms of, uh, you know, really being an autonomous thinking system uh, that will drive this question of what does the ground system have to do? And I, that's why I get back to this whole integrated approach for space, communication, and ground. That we have to think about that, and we have to think about it up front when we first start formulating the project and put all this together. And that leads us uh, really to some thinking we're doing uh, in terms of how do you manage all the data. Uh, one of the things I tell our folks is at the end of the day, it's about the data. Uh, because if you don't get the data down from the mission, then it's worthless whether it's a science mission, a reconnaissance mission, an intelligence mission. So you've got to manage the data, and the ground system is a key component of that. So you can see the little bullets there in red. Obviously, you're talking terabytes of data a day. You know, I, I was just uh, pulling up uh, a recent uh, NASA uh, study, uh, a big data study out of the office of the chief technologist. This was last year, and they talk about ground-based mission systems. They say in 2025, we need to increase computational processing capabilities for the mission by 100 times, enable ad hoc data workflows and reduction of data, and support 100 petabyte scale missions. 100 petabyte scale missions. So there's some, what will it have to do in 2025? That's eight years away. That's what we're thinking about at NASA. And that drives how you manage your ground system. It drives how you design your ground system. And then, uh, you know, as you can see in bullet number two there, uh, if you had all this data just coming down as is, how do you even capture all that data? Uh, what systems do you have to have with your ground network to do that? And of course, then for us, it's important to say now, once we get it, what do we do with it? How do we archive it? How do we get it out to the various users? All those sorts of things have to be brought together in an integrative perspective to make sure that we do this well. And then, uh, so you can see, are we, we're thinking about intelligent ground stations. We're thinking about how do you take archival data that's out there and, and flow that into the real-time data operations of the ground center and say, okay, we saw this in the past. You know, how do we do predictive anomaly detection, those sorts of things. Um, and this is just some examples of today. Uh, SMAP is our surface or soil moisture active passive spacecraft. It's a radar and radiometer spacecraft that measures soil moisture globally around, around the world. And so we actually put in place what we call PAD, Pass Automation Daemon, which really does all of our pass planning automatically based on the parameters and the requirements that were put in by the, the operators and the scientists. So we've been using this now probably for two, two and a half years. Uh, well, you can see January 2015, so roughly a little over two years. And it works great. And you can see that instead of all the past planning work we had to do in the past, we've cut our manpower requirement by three to four FTE, just based on this, I would say, not extremely complex piece of intelligent software. And so obviously we're going to continue to apply this to our, our spacecraft, especially our Earth orbiting spacecraft. But these are just small examples of what we can do today in terms of making our ground systems more efficient and effective. Another one is just uh, more machine learning, and this again is, uh, as I kind of touched on, how do we be able, how are we able to predict anomalies? Are there 
telltale pieces of telemetry out there that will give us some information that says, hey, you better be paying attention to this, or hey, this is to the point where you could even do some you know, uh, forward thinking and we're going to switch to the B side before the A side even fails kind of thing. If you've got enough data and enough analysis and enough machine learning to say this is a valid set of data. So you can see there we're looking at um, actually putting this on our rover on Mars today uh, because we can upload software and change the flight program on the rover. We call it MARTI, uh, MSL Anomaly Detector Telemetry Tool Suite. These guys always come up with a funky acronym. Um, but really, it's taking telemetry data where something hasn't necessarily gone into the red or the yellow, but it says, you know, there's a trend here. We've seen something like this in the past. Uh, therefore, we can be predictive about what may happen. And then that at least allows us to think rationally about do we need to do something or not. But again, I would offer that 10, 15 years from now, the satellite will be doing all of this. It will be saying, hmm, I've got a problem. I've got some predictive telemetry here. I'm going to go ahead and swap to the B side those kind of things. Now, that makes us folks on the ground a little nervous, right? You know, when we think about the spacecraft doing those sorts of things. But, but I believe that we'll be very comfortable with that in 10 to 15 years. So again, how does that impact the design of our ground system? And, and another fairly simple thing is just, you know, as I talked about our deep space network, uh, we've got multiple spacecraft throughout the solar system, not just US, but Indian, French, European, that we support because we're the only 24-7 capability to reach out beyond lunar orbit and communicate with a spacecraft and get data back. So the scheduling of all that is pretty complex and yet uh, you can see the data there. We've actually put in an automated scheduling tool that, as I said, uh, just like the SMAP tool that we talked about, uh, it's working great and you can see that we've reduced our FTE requirements by about three people. Uh, so these types of things are already out there and available for us to use just from a scheduling perspective. But again, we'll go well beyond that when we talk about capability on the spacecraft. So, you know, if we just want to think about this a little bit, one of our engineers kind of put this together in something that we're developing, and again, just using today's technology. Um, you know, what do we have today? We have iPhone, we have Android, we have apps, we have instant messaging, we have chat. Um, we have standard and intuitive GUI interfaces. Uh, we have social networking. We have uh, the ability to collaborate. Uh, uh, you know, we've got integrated development environments. So that's all out there today uh, in the commercial world. And yet I would offer that we haven't necessarily applied a lot of those thinking skills to how we do ground systems today. And so we're trying to take all of that and to say, how do we apply that to our ground systems in the near future because the technology is there. So really we're coming up with what we call this single integrated collaborative environment. And it's very intuitive. Uh, I'm not going to blow the picture up there, but you, you kind of have a dashboard that you can see that if I can just click on any of those and I get information uh, on the mechanical systems, on the, uh, you know, the power system, you know, I can, I can pull up timelines from the past. Uh, I can actually do analysis or I can see analysis. All these things are available just right there from the dashboard. Just like when you pull out your iPhone, I can do Google Maps, I can do email, I can do you know, Safari. You know, it's all right there on one screen. So we're saying on one screen, if I'm an operator, I've got every, I can access everything I need from just telemetry, from analysis, from uh, logs of chat, whatever the case may be, go back in history. Uh, it's all right there. So we're pretty far along in terms of uh, putting this together and then sorting out how we apply it to some of our ground systems. But with today's technology, folks, this is not that hard. We just need to think about how do you apply it. Uh, another key component for us is uh, I've talked about the deep space network and I mentioned briefly up front the fact that ultimately we know we have to go to optical comm as well as RF. It's never going to be either or. But when you're talking these quantities of data coming back from uh, a Europa mission or an Enceladus mission, or when you have astronauts going to Mars, I guarantee you that the public around the world is going to want high definition video in real time, well, five to 12 minute delay, but uh, from Mars. But you know, that, they're going to want that. And you just can't do all that with RF. So now we're actually moving forward with optical comm. Uh, we have a, a, a payload called the Deep Space Optical Communication Payload that's going to fly on that Psyche mission I talked about. 
So we'll have optical comm out in the asteroid belt, beaming lasers back to Earth and communicating with Earth. And the intent of NASA is anything that flies now outside beyond lunar orbit will have an optical comm package on it. So now you can start to build this network around the solar system to be able to communicate optically. But again, think about how much data now we're going to have to deal with uh, with the ground system when you talk optical comm coming down. And in low Earth orbit, we're looking at that as well. So I just wanted to give you that picture that that's kind of the vision we have as you kind of look out beyond the horizon of having that capability. And here's another capability that is very interesting in terms of virtual reality. OnSite is a tool that we're building in collaboration with Microsoft to connect scientists and engineers with the environment of the Curiosity Mars rover. Since we can't put our scientists yet physically on Mars, a technology like this allows us to investigate well, what's possible if we can make them virtually present. This was the first time where I could basically do a 360 and see Mars all around me. I love the fact that people, when they first encounter this project, have a feeling of, wow, you know, I've lived to see this. Instead of looking at 2D images, they can now walk around and explore Mars in their office. It was part inspiring and part just like, wow, I can finally do this thing that I really want to do. I could see using this every single day. It is a different way of exploring. That's transformational. Our plan is to deploy on-site to mission operations this summer and to be controlling rovers on Mars with this technology in July. About that, I'm a scientist in my office. I put on my HoloLens. I now have a complete 3D rendering of the environment around the rover, and it's based on the actual rover photographs as well as the overhead spacecraft reconnaissance photographs. So it's real. And I can see a rock or a, a specimen in 3D now that I couldn't do before in terms of just a 2D image. And that, frankly, gives you dramatically better enhancement of, of what you really want to go do from a science perspective. But, you know, you can apply this in a whole set of different ways, you know. These are just some examples on site we just talked about. Uh, Sidekick is basically the same thing uh, that we've actually deployed up to the space station where the astronauts can put on the HoloLens and then a scientist down on the Earth who has an experiment. You can actually go in and as you're looking at the whole lens on the station, the scientist can be pointing to something on the Earth and say, flip this switch. The astronaut sees that in his hollow lens. So there's all kinds of different things you can think about. Um, there's actually something called Destination Mars down at Kennedy Space Center narrated by Buzz Aldrin, which is you can walk around Mars with this thing now uh, when you go into the visitor center there. And we're also in the lower right there doing, utilizing this for a 3D spacecraft design. So our Euro Europa mission has now rendered their initial spacecraft design in virtual reality. So an engineer can literally walk around with the hollow lens on and say, okay, I put the propulsion unit here, but I see that there could be a, you know, some interference there now that I see the 3D picture. And really utilize that to come up with a more efficient and better design for the spacecraft. But now think about that if I'm a ground system guy, I put on the hollow lens and now I'm with the GPS spacecraft. I can look around it based on the data that I have. I can see that there's a snuggler right beside me, you know, you know, whatever the case may be. So just the whole world of VR, I think, also dramatically potentially changes how we think about interacting with the spacecraft and its operations. So we need to think about that and what does it do for us. And then lastly, uh, this is my last slide. Um, when I was the commander of the 50th Space Wing, you know, we operate GPS out of there. And this is really back in 2003-ish. But even back then, I told the guys, I said, you know, your challenge is to be able to operate the entire GPS constellation from your iPhone. So I think that's the challenge we have. How do we utilize all of this current technology today, which we're probably not doing very well, but also thinking about the incredible capability of the future technology to drive an integrated design for our ground, communication, and satellite system. Uh, I think that's what we need to think about as a community uh, as we move forward. So with that, I'll be happy to uh, take a few questions before we run out of time.
Oh, we got one here. Hi. Hi. Barry Lyons with SGT. Yeah. Um, I know you know who we are. Yeah. <laughs> Um, two items. First of all, you said that the iPhone had amazing capabilities from a processing standpoint. So why don't we just take an iPhone, put it in the satellite, and let it do the processing, and I'll make you a really good deal on this one. <laughs> so, But my second question is, I'm the Vice President of Cyber. I heard everything you said, and I know NASA has to be open to everyone, but I noticed you never talked anything about a secure ground station, secure mission, secu securing that. Is that because you are so open or you don't have that worry? And what can you share with us that you're doing to secure the data and secure what's in storage and secure transmission? Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I, I just didn't choose to talk about that here. Okay. Uh, interestingly, uh, I chair the Cybersecurity Council at JPL and we met yesterday. Uh, NASA has a whole effort called Space Asset Protection uh, I would offer that, that from a NASA perspective, we're probably well behind the DOD. You know, I spent 35 years in the DOD worrying about protecting our spacecraft, protecting our links, all those sorts of things. NASA is really just moving forward in that arena in the last four to five years. But they do have a, a formal program called Space Asset Protection. Each, pro, each system now has to have uh, a program protection plan. Uh, so we at JPL are in the middle of developing what we call the Integrated Program Protection Plan, which says what are the baseline protections that we provide as an institution to the projects? And then the projects take that and say, now what do I have to do to ensure that I am protected? So, so absolutely we are thinking about that. You know, the DSN data links, how do we make them more robust and protected? Uh, things like even at the beginning of the program, how do you ensure that as you design your flight software, you harden it? How do we train our flight software engineers to do that? So these are all actions that we're taking uh, under this rubric of the Space Asset Protection Program that NASA has. Uh, and so, yes, we take it very seriously, uh, even though, yeah, we're, we're open and it's just science. You still don't want someone diddling with your spacecraft or diddling with the data. Let's say somebody diddles with the data and I'm a scientist. I take that data, I write a paper, and suddenly somebody says, wait a minute, that data's wrong. You don't want to be there. So, so we absolutely understand the necessity of this, and we have uh, very uh, robust programs that go forward with this. But we're definitely behind the DOD. And to your first question, we actually have flown a phone in orbit, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> the processor, at least. Yeah, there is one over here. Mario Merri from the European Space Agency. Yes. Um, you have presented a very nice portfolio of uh, very fascinating future missions. Huh? Uh, a lot, some of this at least, uh, will have to be developed with international cooperation and also with uh, the development of international standards uh, in order to be able to optimize the components, the various international components. What are your thoughts about this? Uh, absolutely agree. Um, there's a, a committee that we're a part of, and I never remember, it's CCCDS or something like that. The CCSDS, yeah. I always get the acronyms wrong, but they're, they're a, a body that sets some standards for all the, the ground control and data. So we're a part of that. And, and we are absolutely, certainly JPL, an international organization. I think, you know, I walk through some of those missions. The GRACE follow-on mission is partnership with Germany, DLR. Uh, the SWAT mission, the Surface Water Ocean Topography, is partnership with CONEST, the French Space Agency. You saw, uh, you know, NISAR, that's a partnership with the Indian Space Agency. Uh, you know, we just had uh, Mr. Legault, the head of CNES at JPL last week. I'm going to meet with him in a couple of weeks at the Space Symposium. So, so we are very much an international organization. We have worked with international entities for the last three decades. Uh, I think we do it well. And without those partners, a lot of these missions wouldn't happen. So we are fully on board with international partnering, uh, meeting the standards that we have to meet, and ensuring also that we're secure as a, as a team. So, yes, absolutely. Anything else? Okay, well, I hope this is giving you some food for thought. Uh, I'd be happy to hang around for a few minutes and answer any questions if folks want to do that. I know I think you're scheduled for a break now, so, uh, okay. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. <laughs>